Chapter eight is a lengthy one. Okay. We'll have seven videos for this chapter. Okay. But the nice thing is it's broken into two parts, right? We first talk about delocalized electrons okay, and we really take a deep dive into that idea. See the effects that delocalized electrons have on stability, pKa, and then the products of a reaction. Okay, because those delocalized electrons are important. We saw that way back in chapter two when talking about the acidity of a carboxylic acid versus an alcohol, right? Because in both of those situations, the hydrogen, the acidic hydrogen is on oxygen. Uh, but delocalized electrons changes the pKa by uh, tenfold, okay, 10 pKa units. Once we have that understanding of delocalized electrons, we use that to introduce aromaticity and other electronic effects and see an introduction to the reactions of benzene. And so we'll actually start and finish the chapter talking about benzene. So to refresh our memory from chapter two, what's the difference between localized electrons and delocalized electrons? Okay. If electrons are localized, right, they either belong to a single atom or exist in a single bond that's shared between two atoms. Okay. So we see examples of localized electrons, a sigma bond, a lone pair, could be a pi bond, right? but that just exists in one place. Right. Delocalized electrons are shared by three or more atoms. And so they're often represented by dashed lines like we see down here or multiple resonance structures, which we could show in this situation as well. And you need to be able to identify when electrons are delocalized, even if it's not explicitly shown. Right. So a situation like here, even if I just showed one of the resonance contributors with the pi bond in one location and just the sigma bond in another, you should realize, okay, that pi bond could be delocalized in either place. So before we get to that understanding, let's start, as I just mentioned, by thinking about benzene. Yep. And the original structure of benzene was a mystery because benzene came to exist, well, it's always existed, one could argue, but right, the question of what benzene was arose before delocalized electrons had been discovered. And there was some knowledge at the beginning, okay, we've got a molecular formula of C6H6. Okay. Now, if we had a saturated hydrocarbon, it would be C6H14, meaning we have four degrees of unsaturation. Remember that idea from chapter five. Okay. And if I take benzene and I replace it with X, call it a halogen in this case, I, I get a single monosubstituted compound. If I do it again, then I get three different di-substituted compounds. Okay. And the fact that it forms only one monosubstituted compound tells you that all of the hydrogens in benzene are identical. Right? So that eliminates the fact that it could be a straight chain of six carbons, for example, because the hydrogens on the end would be different from the hydrogens in the middle. So what does that tell us? Okay, well, I could have a structure like this with two triple bonds because these six hydrogens are identical to these six hydrogens. And right, I have six carbons and six hydrogens. So that meets all of the criteria and has four degrees of unsaturation. And so does this structure here with alternating single and double bonds in a ring, four degrees of unsaturation. C6H6 and all of the hydrogens are identical to one another. So if we knew just the fact that it forms one monosubstituted compound, then we would be good with that. Okay? But the disubstituted compounds throw some trouble into those structures. Okay? Because if I take the first proposed structure and disubstitute it, right now two substituents, well, I get different structures if there's one here right, where they're both on the same end or on opposite ends. Okay, so that's two, but remember that benzene forms three different disubstituted compounds. Right? So that means that this compound cannot be the correct structure of benzene. Okay. And what about the other one with the alternating single and double bonds? Okay. Replace it with two bromines in this case, and it's possible to get four 
different dye substituted products, right? One where they're a carbon apart, one where they're two carbons apart, and then two different structures where they're adjacent, but these would be different based on if they're separated by a single bond or a double bond, right? Due to the difference in length of carbon hydrogen bonds that this thing would have, we get four different products, meaning that there are no structures that have been shown yet in the slides that meet all the evidence that had been presented for benzene. Yeah. And the structure for benzene was first dreamed up by this guy, right, Friedrich Kekule. And what he said was that benzene might be an idea or a compound that's a mixture of two things in rapid equilibrium. Okay, those alternating single and double bonds, I would notice the position of the single and double bonds alternates here, right? Rapid equilibrium between these two. If that's the case, then we would just form three disubstituted products. And okay, because that last one be, it would be in rapid equilibrium so much so that we couldn't distinguish it. Right, so now jumping back a slide, these two become one and we get three products overall. Yep. And this is a picture of Kekule down here. This guy's one of the godfathers of chemistry, right? Students that worked underneath him won three out of the five, first five Nobel prizes, right? Van Hoff, Fisher and Bayer, names you've heard in Gen Chem and organics so far, all worked under him. Yep. So he was the one that first proposed this idea, two compounds in rapid equilibrium. Okay. Later evidence for benzene came in proving the fact that it's a cyclic compound. Okay. Paul Sabatier discovered this, working with hydrogen, nickel, high pressure, high temperature. Okay, you can't just treat benzene with hydrogen and palladium on carbon and take it to an alkane, won't work. Right? You could do that to a standard alkene, it doesn't work for benzene because of that aromaticity we'll talk about at the end of the chapter. Uh, but this proved that it was cyclic, okay? confirmed it in 1910. But benzene in fact, right, is not rapid equilibrium between two compounds. Okay? The next discussion, discovery came via X-ray diffraction and electron diffraction told us that benzene is planar and all the carbon-carbon bonds have the same length, that bond length being slightly longer than a double bond and slightly shorter than a single bond. So it's somewhere between a single and a double bond, right? Meaning it has the same electron density between each of the carbons. That tells us that the pi electrons have to be delocalized, not strictly between the bonds. Rather, they move freely throughout the molecule, like you see here in structure C, okay, in the heat map up top, that electron density. Okay. So what's going on? I've got a planar structure of these carbons that are sp2 hybridized. Right? The overlap here form all of the sigma bonds. But then the p orbitals, right? Because remember, it's sp2 hybridized, so it has an unhybridized p orbitals. Unhy each carbon has an unhybridized p orbital, six total in benzene. Those are perpendicular to the hybridized orbitals, and they kind of all combine with one another to form delocalized electrons. So how do I show that? Well, you can show the two resonance structures for benzene, which is shown on the next slide here, two resonance contributors, jumping back to slide 10 here. You can show it with that dashed line, right? delocalized electrons belonging throughout the molecule, or this is the most common way that benzene is shown. Okay? The hexagon representing the six carbons and then a circle throughout. Both of these are good at showing the fact that the electrons are delocalized. They don't show how many pi electrons are delocalized. Right? It's up to you to know that that number is six six delocalized pi electrons in benzene. And again, to recap other information you need to know, each carbon is sp2 hybridized, bond angle between them of 120 degrees. Benzene is planar, right? Don't confuse it with cyclohexane. Cyclohexane has the boat structure or the chair structure, right? Chair being more stable. Benzene is planar. And that happens so that the p orbitals all overlap with one another so that we get delocalized pi electrons that don't belong to a single atom, but rather the whole molecule. We have two resonance contributors, 
Remember these terms from general chemistry, two resonance contributors, one resonance hybrid. These are how we draw it conveniently on paper. This is what actually exists in the environment. Okay, you might recall this slide from GenChem, right? Neither resonance contributor actually exists, nor does a hybrid jump between the two, right? You combine them together. The resonance hybrid is what you can actually find. What about cyclooctatetraene? Okay, so this adds two more carbons, right? Cyclooctate means we have C8, and it adds two more pi electrons. Okay. Here, for cyclooctatetraene, it's not planar, okay? because for maximum p orbital overlap, right, we want these things to right, lie in the same plane. Okay. Because it's not planar, they're not getting maximum overlap, so it doesn't have delocalized electrons. And we'll talk more about that at the end of the chapter with something known as Huckel's rule. How do we identify something that has that extra stability? So what we'll focus on in this video and video two from chapter eight, sorry for the rest of this video and all of video two, is drawing resonance contributors and the proper way to show delocalized electrons. Because remember, we can't conveniently always show a resonance hybrid. We draw resonance structures to show the different resonance contributors. Okay. So we need an easy way to show the delocalized electrons that result from the p orbital of one atom overlapping the p orbitals of the adjacent atoms, right? So here, it's these p orbitals that are overlapping to form those delocalized electrons. What are my rules for drawing? Yep, this is a very important slide, number 15. Right? You wanna put a star next to this one. After you draw a Lewis structure, if you're drawing resonance contributors, what do you need to keep in mind? Well, we're only moving electrons in resonance contributors. We don't move atoms, because if you start moving atoms, right, you're drawing isomers, not resonance contributors. You can only ever move pi electrons or lone pair electrons, right? You can't move sigma electrons because then you would be breaking a bond, okay, and moving an atom. So you can move pi electrons, but not sigma electrons. Uh, number three, total number of electrons in the molecule does not change because then you would be drawing ions. Uh, all the structures must have the same net charge, every resonance contributor. Lastly, electrons always move toward sp2 or sp hybridized atoms. Okay? You can't move electrons toward an sp3 hybridized atom because sp3 hybridized atoms have complete octets and they don't have pi bonds that can break. So don't push things towards things that are sp3 hybridized. Let's look at a couple of examples. Okay. What works up here? Well, this is sp hybridized, right? So for a carbocation, I can move this pi electron density over, move the, pi, the carbocation from here to here. Two resonance contributors. That's fine to do. Resonance hybrid has a partial bond here, partial bond there, and a slight partial positive on each of the carbons because the positive charge exists both here and here simultaneously. But notice right, that that's popping a bond over and moving my positive charge. If I move that down here, well, now my carbocation is too far away. I can't move that pi bond in this bottom example because the carbon that's closest to my cursor right now right, is sp3 hybridized. It can't accept those pi electrons and move the positive charge. So this positive charge is localized. These pi electrons are localized. And so be careful with these. Here's another example, right? Three resonance contributors with a carbocation. So this is something that would be even more stable than the previous example, because it has three resonance contributors, it's more readily able to bear that positive charge because the pi electrons are shared by five carbons, right? Whereas previously it was just shared by three. Right? The more resonance contributors something has, the more stable it is. That's an important idea from chapter eight. Another example, right here, yeah, looking at two resonance contributors, moving a lone pair of electrons, which is okay to do, right, to the bond here, form a pi bond, kick this pi bond up to form a lone pair. Right. 
So these are two resonance contributors. This is a resonance hybrid. So can't do it down here though with the methylene group in between because again, it's sp3 hybridized. Okay. In this situation, the left-hand resonance contributor is more stable because it doesn't have the charges like this one does, but there's still two resonance contributors nonetheless. And you need to have this idea be able to identify minor resonance contributors like that one to predict reaction products later in chapter eight. Yep. One more example. Right. Here we're moving pi electrons over twice right, to form a positive charge here, negative charge over there. But that's okay. It looks a little weird to do because I didn't have anything that was sp3 hybridized in the middle. Right. This was sp hybridized. So I move them over. Yep, fine. Move that pi bond over. Resonance hybrid between the two. And it's those delocalized electrons that affect your protein structure, okay? The reason proteins fold into alpha helices and beta sheets, if you've heard about those in your biology classes, if not, you'll hear about them in biochemistry, right? It's due to delocalized electrons within peptide bonds, okay? This bond can't freely rotate because it's not a true sigma bond, right? It has a resonance contributor over here. And that's why we see things fold the way they do more of a fun fact for you. Yep. So that's where we'll finish our first video from chapter eight, but we will pick those ideas back up in the second video when we talk about drawing these resonance contributors and how to identify them.